Hello, everybody, and welcome to Urban Consulate. I am Naima Bilal, your host of this evening's conversation called Truth Telling from the Top. It is a conversation where we will explore how civic leaders can lean into truth telling and the truth and repair within their organizations. And we're also going to examine together some of the landmines that come along with that work and some of the fears that we can begin to shed as we work to practice equity within our different spheres of influence. We will be taking questions at the end of our conversation today from you. So please get your fingers ready. We'd love to hear you interacting and see you interacting in the chat um, because this is meant to be a two-way dialogue and we're really excited about this conversation. It's gonna be a good one. As I said earlier, it's gonna be fire. Um, this conversation is made possible to some extraordinary partners here at Urban Consulate Cincinnati. Um, many, many thanks to our consulate team who helps produce these talks on a monthly basis. I'd also like to thank Afrosheen, um, a big partner of ours, the Mercantile Library. You can see that I am, I've got the Mercantile Library behind me, beautiful space in downtown Cincinnati urge anybody living in Cincinnati, if you haven't been, please take a visit down. It's a big wide open space and they can leave the windows open for you and you can remain safe and socially distant um, and still explore the richness of the stacks. Um, also want to thank our philanthropic partner, the Hale Foundation. Um, and I definitely want to remember Megan Trishler, our fellow co-host uh, between me, G. Horton, and um, Megan. We call ourselves the Three-Legged Stool. And Megan tonight will be taking questions and dropping some links in the chat. So thanks so much um, to everybody for making this evening possible. So speaking of truth telling, 528 some odd years ago, um, this man named Christopher Columbus took a voyage across the Atlantic Ocean looking for a water route to Asia. And his trip actually marked the beginning of European colonization. Um, some people like to say European expansion. And today we're gonna call a thing a thing and we're gonna call it European colonization. Um, so in the spirit of truth telling, I'm very, very um, grounded in the truth and clarity that today uh, we recognize as Indigenous Peoples Day. And we have an opportunity to change the narrative of our past. And certainly we cannot change the course of history. We certainly cannot dial back the hands of time to undo the impacts of colonization around the world. But we can restory the narrative and return that story to what matters. And here in Cincinnati, that has special meaning for us. Um, and we want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Osage Nation, the Shawnee Nation, the Miami Nation, the Adena Nation, and Hopewell Nation. And so it is this wide tapestry of land that we occupy to this day. And we want to acknowledge that as a, our first contribution to our well of truth this evening. So thank you for joining us on a journey of truth telling. Um, so we, just to frame the conversation a little bit, I wanna start with a quote by an extraordinary man that we all know, a man whose words today ring and ring true um, so many decades later. And what this man said was, it is the responsibility of the black writer to excavate and excavate the real history of this country to tell us what really happened to get us where we are now. He says, we must tell the truth until we can no longer bear it. These were the words of iconic art author, um, philosopher, um, James Baldwin. And uh, decades ago, he told some searing truths about our country as a nation. Um, 
And those words still ring so true today. And I think of them as kind of like a, a space roar. You know, um, those who study space, they study the, the, the sounds in space. And one of the oldest sounds that scientists register today is called a space roar, um, a sound that probably occurred billions of years ago, and yet it's still detectable and so visceral. This is how I characterize James Baldwin's words today. Um, today, we're going to hear from some local and civic leaders as they express some of their own essential truths. They will talk us through what it feels like to tell the truth from their seats of leadership and also tell the truth about the, the, the abundance on the side of telling truth and the landmines of telling truth. Um, we'll also talk about the counterpart to the truth, which is the lie. Um, and we'll talk about how that shows up. We'll talk about the utility of the lack of truth and in our world and in our lives. So um, we'll answer a lot of good questions. What lies at the intersection of truth telling and leadership? That's what it's all about. I hope you're as excited about this conversation as I am and our guests are. So I am going to now introduce our three fantastic guests one of which is our very own G. Horton, who will be offering an artist's perspective about truth telling. I'm first excited to welcome to the consulate stage, Jennifer A. Ingram, CEO of Calibrated Lens. Hey, Jen. Living and leading by example, Jennifer's career has been forged throughout her greatest passions inspiring others to embrace their journey, live their truth, and thrive authentically while promoting a unified vision for a more equitable and inclusive communities. Come on, can, can I just read that again? While promoting a unified vision for more equitable and inclusive communities. A student of life and continuous learner, Jennifer has traveled the globe visiting six continents and over 30 countries. Okay, extra passport pages. She approaches differences with curiosity and humility seeking to understand how others experience life, foster a sense of belonging and celebrate differences. Jennifer is the founder and CEO of Calibrated Lens LLC, a boutique consulting firm with the mission of inspiring clients to facilitate sustainable change, to optimize performance, presence, and productivity by centering equity and inclusion. Before launching Calibrated Lens, she served as the first vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the United Way of Greater Cincinnati, the sixth largest United Way in the country. In this role, she gained national attention for the publication of the organization's inaugural DEI community report. A couple of noteworthy accomplishments during her tenure included leading the planning and implementation of the first community-wide event in the tri-state area in recognition of the National Day of Racial Healing. Jen is also responsible for organizing the first ever LGBT plus center discussion at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Welcome, Jen. It is such an honor to have you here. Next, I'd love to welcome to the Urban Consulate Cincinnati view and stage, Mr. John Ferry. John is the executive director of the Mercantile Library and also obviously one of our partners here at Urban Consulate Cincinnati. Welcome. The Mercantile Library is a gathering place for books and writers and thinkers and it has been so since 1835. John still cannot believe his good fortune of working at the library. After previous careers in television and print journalism, John works directly with the nonprofit's library board, the nonprofit library's board, with the directive to make and keep the library relevant. Since taking the job in 2015, John worked to increase membership through a seemingly constant series of events, book clubs, lectures, and performances. Recently, the Mercantile Library has hosted diverse speakers and writers, including Margaret Atwood, Chuck D., Min Jin Lee, 
and Anand Girdardas, who we had the great pleasure of hosting for our Urban Consulate um, Civic Exchange last year, Cross City Exchange last year, excuse me. John received a history degree from the University of Chicago and lives with his family in Hyde Park. John, welcome. We are so, so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. And then I wanna welcome back my homie, <laughs> G Horton, artist extraordinaire. Just, I, I just wanna really call G Mr. Cincinnati is what I wanna call you. Yes. I don't know how you feel about that. Stop, stop it. <laughs> but it you know, this is an extraordinary partner, person, friend, intellect, artist. Um, we are so, so glad that you are part of this dialogue today. So um, one quick reminder for those in our audience, we will be answering questions at the very end of this dialogue today. So please, please remember them, drop them in the chat, and we'll bring you up bring those questions up at the end of our dialogue. So this is our normal practice. I like to just check in with my friends and ask the human question, how are you today? How are you feeling today? Gene, let me start with you. You know, I feel good. It feels good to, uh, it's interesting to be on a, like on the other side of the fence right now and as um, someone who's receiving um, questions. So I'm excited to, uh, to, to, to be here ultimately, but also to be in the seat. So thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you. John, talk to me. How are you? Feel good. Uh, yeah. Had a nice couple of days. It's been, um, it's pleasantly quiet. I'm afraid it might be the quiet before the storm, but last couple of days I felt kind of quiet and nice. Mm. That's good. We're, we're, we're going to change that. Don't worry. We'll, uh, <laughs> this, this dialogue will kind of shake it up a little bit. Jen, talk to me. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling excited and uh, optimistic. We got a new puppy a couple of weeks ago, and he is doing extremely well, acclimating to his new home. Uh, and I'm sleeping through the night now. So I am feeling well rested and excited to be here with you all today. Oh, well, first of all, congratulations on your puppy. And I got a little glimpse and he's adorable. Thank so you. I see how he's bringing you a lot of joy. So it's yeah. good to do that. Same here. My baby girl celebrated her birthday this weekend and it was a quarantine birthday. So, you know, it was nice, beautiful. Okay. First off, let me ask you this. Let's do some definition setting just amongst us right? Just what is the truth anyway? Let's just start there. John, tell me, what's your definition of the truth? Um, boy, I'm glad you started me off with an easy one there. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd like to say, you know, the truth should be immutable and unchangeable, but um, I know different people can have different truths even from the same experience. Um, but even under those circumstances, I feel like one of those truths is more the truth. Um, boy, that's a tough question. I mean, you know, the easy answer is that which is, right? Hmm. Yeah. It's the truth that we're on here right now. Um, but other truths are a lot more complex. I mean, it feels like the bigger the truth, the harder it is to nail down. Huh. So I want I want to, can you parking lot that that thought? Because we're gonna come back to that. All right. Jen, what's your functional definition of the truth? So I appreciate uh, this question. I think that oftentimes we tend to uh, confuse what is true and the truth. Um, realizing that what is true is that we are here because of the truth that we are only here. Right? After you get too philosophical, we are also simultaneously at home, uh, quarantining-esque, right? I think that as we look at the ways in which we have crafted uh, the truth uh, as a society, uh, it's important to understand that that is someone's what is true to someone, but for other folks, it may not be the truth or the universal truth. And to John's point around, you know, each individual having their own truths, I think that that's so important to understand in that it is a very individualized thing, but it's also very communal. 
It's very universal. And understanding how we have created narratives around what is true versus the truth uh, is definitely a part of my working definition uh, uh, of you know, truth. The uh, last point that I will add is, um, you know, understanding, you know, one of the uh, events you mentioned, you know, the National Day of Racial Healing was something that I was so excited to bring to this community and to work with so many wonderful local leaders uh, to make come to fruition. But uh, it was based on the quote by James Baldwin that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced realizing that we are all striving after different versions of the truth. We are all operating from our own lived experience, which is true, but in a global context, is that true? So with that, um, I think that, you know, it's complex, it's ambiguous, but understanding that there's a clear delineation between what is actually true and the truth. Mm. Gee, I feel like an artist's heart, like an artist cannot help but tell the truth because that's kind of like your job so what does truth mean for you you know i think on a personal level i think i think the truth is to function in the space that there's little there's little distortion from um how you feel what resonates within you um and in versus what society says you you should feel or how you should act. I think on a personal level, truth is to live in that honesty. But I also think like, you know, as you, you, you put society within context and you ask that same question, I think like happiness, the truth is something that you, you pursue. You got to chase it. It's not, it's not right in front of your eyes. It's not easy to attain. And because of that, um, it's it's something that you have to approach from an investigative perspective or approach, right? I think as artists, like you said, I think we're wired to really, our job is to live in that space where, where, where our art reflects the truth. And in my opinion, I think some of the best art does that. It reflects the truth and it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, and to me, I think that that's what makes the best truth. And that, that's what makes the best art is that that art that tells the truth in a way in which it's so damn hard to really like look beyond it because it's so real and it's so raw. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's such a complex question, man. And um, you know, I think every day, me as an artist, the the challenge is to live how how much of that truth can I can I try to live into or step into? Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process for sure. Oh, so the, we're going to talk about how we live into our truth because, you know, I sometimes get stuck in the definitions, which is like 50,000 foot level, but we're here today to talk more about like the 5,000 foot level. How can we live out and how can we embody and express truth in our everyday lives? And the way I, I want to start out is with vocation, right? So each of you come here today with passions, with your work you know, things that we do to hopefully make a change in the world, but things you also do to earn a paycheck, right? Um, this is part, part of our world. I'd love to hear from each of your viewpoints and what you do every day as a person. I'd love to ask you how truth telling shows up in your vocation. And I'm gonna start with you, John, because your background as a journalist makes me curious, like, you know, what are the truth telling applications in the world of a writer, especially as a reporter in an era of alternative facts? Yeah. So how does that show up for you? Well, I mean, I, I, I feel like um, the truth has become, I mean, the truth used to feel simple. Like this is true, that ain't true, but in the world we're living in today, you know, within the first week of this presidency we're in, the, a spokesperson said, oh, these are alternate truths. And like, like no one's here to talk politics, but the truth in the context of 2020 is everyone's lying. <laughs> so, I mean, being a journalist, 
I, I left five years ago and um, it feels like a million years ago. Like, I feel like when I wrote stuff, it was generally accepted to be true. Um, and I did a good job and I, I worked hard and um, I tried to make sure I talked to both sides and all the sides and all that jazz. But um, for us as a society, as a culture, to, to lose the idea of truth is so painful. Um, and, you know, even listening to G, G saying an artist speaks the truth, like he does, G does. Um, but even within that, like, he's speaking the truth as he knows it and making art. And, you know, I used to be a journalist and now I run a library and they're really similar. You know, you want to hear from different voices. You want to bring different people to the front. Um, the truth, I mean, maybe it was never as simple as it seemed, but, and there's a lot of people will say, newspapers and journalists have been lying to us for 200 years and, and they're partly right. I mean, journalists are part of a big, big machine. We're all part of a machine in one way or another, but um, I feel like I've said a lot of words in a row and not answered your question. Um, yeah, but you're, you're home, you're homing in on a very vital point and that in some instances, the truth can be relative. Yeah. And, like I, I know, for example, you know, I think it was the, there was a, a major publication in Alabama, uh, equivalent to the Cincinnati Enquirer who made this stunning sort of admission of their role in perpetuating systemic racism. Right. So at the turn of the century, when Jim Crow was roaring at its loudest, they added to this narrative that Black Alabamians were, I'm sorry, is it Alabamians? <laughs> um, that they were sort of the, the criminal enterprises of the state and they were unworthy and they were uh, somehow this justification and dehumanization, dehumanizing of Black people justified the, the ushering in of, of violent terror of Jim Crow. And so like, I, I look at that enterprise and look at to how it's kind of come to 2020. And then we see the New York Times, like arguably one of the world's, world's most visible uh, newspaper publications that released 1619, which starts us not at Plymouth Rock, but at Jamestown, you know? So it's like by, by repositioning where we start in our history, we tell the same story, but we start it in a different place. So I don't know, it's just fascinating to me to see how that all works. Jen, talk about your world and what you do. How, how do you see sh truth telling show up in your work? Absolutely, so I, I wanna start and build off of John's comments. Um, my, the name of my firm is Calibrated Lens. Each of us has a lens that we use to view the world and understanding that through the experiences and gaining proximity to the experiences of others, our lens becomes calibrated. The more aware we become of our, our own individual lived experiences in relation to others, we will start to garner a collective truth. And so I think it's really important to start there. As it relates to how truth comes up in the work that I do, I think it, it's wide ranging. Um, so looking at traditional diversity and inclusion programs, they were birthed out of crisis, right? What was the crisis? The civil rights movement, the Kerner report, affirmative action planning, right? And we had this really methodical way of counting heads and looking at representation as being the basis for uh, a progressive uh, and inclusive society, an equitable society. And that is not always the case. Uh, in more recent years, you've seen this old uh, equation as I speak to, right, diversity equals inclusion shift to include not only diversity and inclusion, but equity, realizing that diversity is happening, inclusion is intentional, and equity is deliberate. And with that in mind, as we look at what it means to incorporate equity, 
Are we talking about gender equity? Are we talking about racial equity? And understanding that a focus on equity is not the same thing as a diversity and inclusion program. These are three very different words, three very different strategies and tactics to uphold and make progress around efforts. And so I think that again, we have leaned on what was true that representation equates to progress, but that is not the truth and the fullness of an experience of inclusion and opportunity for advancement and to actualize the potential that so many people have. If we're talking about gender equity, there's so many women that are going to leave from the top of organization. Uh, we look at the top of most uh, uh, corporate and uh, 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 organizations, right? They're predominantly male. If we look at the tops of nonprofits, in many communities, nonprofits predominantly serve people of color. But when you look at the boards and the leadership of organizations, they're not reflective or, uh, uh, or show a racial concordance uh, among those that are served. And so I think that it's really important as we look at what it means to lean into what is the truth, it requires both having representation, but not in a tokenizing way, which is something that we have normalized as a way of having diversity at the table without actualizing true inclusion uh, of those people. And so instead, what we're seeing more of is assimilation and tokenizing by seeing a presence, but not necessarily embracing the fullness of all that that person, uh, be it from any marginalized community, may bring to a table, may bring to a community, may bring to an organization. Uh, additionally, the, the last point that I'll add around uh, how does truth show up in my work, I mentioned, right, including equity is not being uh, a part of or in isolation traditional diversity and inclusion work. Just because you added equity into the title of a leader or you, ha you have a statement does not necessarily mean that the organization is doing the work. Uh, and so what it means to do the work of equity is an acknowledgement of the past, acknowledgement of historical ills, uh, and as, additionally, if you are explicitly talking about becoming an anti-racist organization, if you have not first struck, uh, attempted to uh, uh, see racial equity, then you are headed down the next path of a, of a, a catchphrase that you may not be able to actualize if you don't first understand the need to acknowledge the historical uh, uh, implications and the systemic uh, 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 root causes of inequities in our nation mm. I'm, yeah i feel like we should have we should have sent jen a mic <laughs> because i feel like she's gonna be dropping in a lot tonight <laughs> yeah, several mics yeah <laughs> damn okay what she said All right. <laughs> thank you jen like like seriously jen i one of the things that i w when your name came up to be a guest it was the the fact of you speak the truth, and and um, I think we all appreciate that. And if you don't, there's there's definitely a need to appreciate it even more. Um, can I touch on it real quick, Naima? How's it showing up in my work? Yes. You know, I think I was talking to Megan, um, other co-host, about this um, on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. How does truth show up for artists? And I think it shows up in this this a very innocent, pure moment within the creative process when the artists are creative, um, they experience a, a creative idea. And it's like, John, I'm sure you can appreciate this when it just, the light bulb, it clicks and you have that aha moment. And it's like, you feel like this idea concept was sent from a source beyond yourself. That moment, within that process is when, which I feel that art is at its purest moment and it is entirely in a, within a, a, a vessel of truth. It's undistorted, it's not, it, it's pure and it's raw and it's real. Um, and how it shows, that's how it shows up in, in my space, you know, and I'm in my studio right now and I have those moments all the time where it's like, I'm dancing in this place. I'm selling, I'm running around because it's just like I'm experiencing something that is just, it is, it's unexplainable. Um, what happens though in 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 my world, in the art world, and in, in, in this applies to every other world, is the truth becomes it, it begins to be distorted, right? 
it begins to become distorted when an idea or the concept is then shared with the rest of the world. So the bigger question is, who is really distorting the truth and why are they distorting the truth? That is one question that I tend to ask myself. You know, I, I love John so much and he gave me a shout out about, you know, I speak the truth. I'm trying. I, I don't, I can't fully take that compliment because I have so much more to offer and so much truth to really step into. And I, I say that to, the, to, to everyone is just because I've been studying some of the best damn truth tellers who walk this planet. And what I'm really talking about is, is Toni Morrison. I am obsessed with Toni Morrison. I am obsessed with her and her creative process, but her, her ability to stay and live within the truth and tell the stories from her truth in absence of this concept she calls the white gaze. Mm. This white gaze, from my understanding, is when folks who are not white tend to create works that are suitable, are justified, or can help explain their art through the lens for white people. And she has, uh, in every interview I've listened to, she's talked about and encouraged um, all creatives to dodge the white gaze. And that is something as an artist, I'm trying to um, lean more into creating work that is unexplainable. It just, it's just the truth and it's beyond distortion. So I think what happens in, in this art world is, you know, we, we create works of art and it's, it remains the truth, but the industry gets a hold of it. And then they monetize it. Uh, your work is worth this, this, and that, which is honestly is the distortion of, of the truth. Who are you to tell me or any other creative what my work is really worth? Um, so it's just those type of examples that can really pigeonhole creatives. It can really pigeonhole the industry, but tend to be a, a direct distortion of what the truth could look like and feel like in the art space. What's I want to stay on this pathway because I am fascinated by the dichotomy of the artist's life, the freedom that an artist may have. The way my sister calls it is, is like the, the Aladdin analogy. So it's like you've got these superpowers, right? But you have a tiny, teeny, tiny dwelling place. So you've got all this power in your hands to say some meaningful things. And yet you may be pigeonholed. Like I think about Basquiat, right? And how his work like conveyed all of this beauty, right? There was some, there was a lot of irony, right? That that showed up in his work too. And yet it was commodified, right? Right. Um, but but on a different lens, using a different lens, I always see artists as kind of like a protected class of truth tellers. And here's what I mean by that. In some ways, visual art, music, dance, people see it as sort of this readily accessible expression, right? And so I have this hunch, and tell me if I'm on base, but I have this hunch that artists get more of a pass as opposed to maybe a civic leader or a politician or some other public figure in telling the truth. And that to me makes artists like the most powerful people in the whatever truth-telling mode you want to be. It, right. Am I off base with that? How do you, how do No, that... I'm with you, I'm with you. And I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. There are some artists who do get a pass. And I think um, that everything you said is that, that I agree with that. But on the other hand, I also think that there's a lot of artists who look like me, <laughs> look like Jen, <laughs> look like you, who, who, whose work can be viewed dangerous. Art can be dangerous on, on the other hand. You know, we, uh, we put on these capes on one hand, but on the other hand, this shit is dangerous and it can cost you your life. And it has caused a lot of creatives who really stood out and stood up for what they believe in and cost them their lives. You know, going back to Toni Morrison, the only reason why I'm bringing her back because I'm so obsessed with her. Uh, she even said art is dangerous and she, she provided an example. She said, um, I think it's one of her novels, um, I think it's Paradise, which is an incredible book. It was, it was banned 
from the prison system, from, from a certain prison in Texas, because they thought that her work of art was powerful enough to cause an uprising in the prison system. So they banned that book. And it was really, in way, and the funny thing about it is when they sent her that letter saying that her book was banned, she took it as the biggest compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I say that to say that that is the power of art. It, it can, on one hand, it can really save lives and inspire people, but also um, the masses tend to look at it as, as a threat. No different from, you know, um, slaves who, who were killed because they were reading a book. Mm. It has art in, in education and breaking beyond the access it can be viewed as a threat. And I just want to acknowledge on one hand, yes, superhero, yes, we live in this bubble. Yes, we can articulate and, and thread the needle. But on the other side of it, the shit is dangerous and it can cost you your life. Um, well, so I, I wanna, can, I, can I add something? Go ahead. So uh, G, you are spot on. And I just wanna do a crosswalk from art to the workplace. Right. If we look at things that have been normalized, right, uh, uh, the culture of many organizations, it is based in dominant culture. And if you deviate from those parameters of dominant culture, then you are seen as the problem. You are viewed as the disruptor. Right. But if we're talking about what is the truth, if everyone on a team is having the same experience until you start to disaggregate the data uh, of team dynamics to see that, you know, perhaps one person is saying, no, I, I don't feel that my voice is heard. No, I don't feel that my supervisor hears me and has my best interest at heart. Uh, I feel like I'm just another number. Then we start to get into the crux of understanding the nuances and differences of multiple truths, right? And so, you know, one of the elements of doing equity work specifically is the need to disaggregate data to understand those multiple truths. Looking at a picture in aggregate is something that is true. Uh, but when we think about what does it mean to actually do the work to disaggregate data, you then get a very, uh, 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 a more clear picture of the various truths that oftentimes exist and are variant based on demographic groups. And then when you start to look at folks that sit at the intersections of multiple underrepresented groups, then you start to see a, a completely different or variant experience. And so I think that, G, to your point around the white gaze, I think that if we're going to talk about what that looks like in organizations, it's dominant culture and that being the standard of culture. That is a certain way of presenting becoming the gold star or standard of professionalism. It is looking at the written word as gospel and anything that variates or, or, or is a variant from uh, uh, the King's English and specifically, you know, call, calls out and carves out every grammatical nuance and this and that, right? That's power of the written word and that's a, a characteristics of dominant culture. And so if we are to hold multiple truths, we have to start to unpack and understand understand first what is dominant culture two how is it showing up in our systems in our environment and instead of looking at individuals as being the problems start to look at the systems that we have in place that are either advancing uh, or potentially uh, uh, holding others back not intentionally uh, right it's these uh, benign events that we just say oh they're anecdotal right oh that doesn't really happen uh, when you don't have data to substantiate a claim uh, but oftentimes that's something that is true but it's not the complete truth mm. john i want to get you in on this because you lead an institution with a legacy long legacy we're talking 1835 here talk can can you talk candidly, maybe as openly as you can about what it means to step into leadership in an institution. And you have to deal with some dual legacy. Um, how has truth telling shown up? And what has been your way of sort of positioning yourself in the work of bringing about equity, belonging, diversity, representation? Walk us through that process. Um. I, I'm glad to, uh, and I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, you know the Montgomery Advertiser 
which did, you know, apologize for specifically how it covered lynchings, mm -hmm. you know, and then the LA Times, another terrific paper, recently apologized for how it covered events in like the 1950s and, and 60s in particular. Um, and so that's commendable. That's, but it's also kind of easy, you know, oh, we were terrible 100 years ago. Um, we were bad in the 50s. You know, it'd be really brave if the advertiser and the Times said, let's take a look at last week, last month, a year ago today. Um, because now they can say it is true that we have apologized for some of our mistakes in the past. Hmm. But it's not the truth that they, I mean, it's super righteous. Hey, great, we were lousy how we covered lynchings. Well, yeah, how'd you do last week, last month, last year? How'd you do today? How are you gonna do tomorrow? Those are harder questions, yeah. which kind of speaks to, uh, you know, that does bring me back to the question, but like, you have to be careful on this stuff To There's always an easy path. There's always an easy way to maintain the power structure. Say, hey, we're working on it. Look, front page, we said we were wrong. We said we are sorry. Hmm. Now let's get back, you know, they, you know, then you look and you're like, well, shit, they didn't change anything. Right. You know? Well, it's a great, it's a great way to buy time. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It's a great way to fake righteous. <laughs> And it's not the truth. Yeah, it's true. Right. Mm. Well, um, I, yeah, go ahead. You know, we had to make changes at the library uh, and it, it took, you know, it, 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 it takes a while, it's taking a while. Um, you know, I found out really early, I was like, wow, it is so easy to stay the course. It is, I mean, it's like, it's like tracks. Mm -hmm. Like, a, it's really hard for a train to do a U-turn, can't. Mm -hmm. Even to make a change, you know, someone's got to pull that lever and then you can, you know, at, a, at, a, at an angle, but you know, it's a pretty acute angle and it's not all that obtuse. So it's really hard and it is so easy to stay the course, to make small adjustments, but making big adjustments, that's hard. And it requires like, the, like, like a daily discipline that frankly, I didn't have. I didn't, it, it took, you know, you got to build up those muscles to, and you know, gee, you and I were talking about the first time I spoke to Jen. Jen was like, don't go to Jen if you're looking for the easy way out. <laughs> you will you will walk away deeply disappointed um because she's not going to give it to you i mean th you know that's the difference between the truth what's true and what's the truth she gives you the truth well so and, but fundamentally though john it isn't isn't it hard because there's so much utility in the lie i mean we're talking about the truth right so we're using language of abundance to name things as for what they are and not sort of um, uh, sort of deficit language. When we talk about the lie, there is usefulness in a lie. It, it may not be morally aligned with like our North Stars, but sometimes it's effective. And so we adhere and uphold whatever lies we've been told to stay the course because frankly, it's easier, because it's comfortable. But in, in main, it's profitable, it's profitable. Um, and one thing that that strikes me is, is that oof, there's fear there. And so when I think about what it means to be a leader and tell the truth, it's almost as if not, it's almost as if maintaining the lie, um, in maintaining the lie, we don't have to confront who we really are. Right. It's 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 so easy. It's built to work this way for centuries at a time. Like you asked, how how did we change the library? And very much a work in progress. 
you know, we weren't that bad and we're not that good. We're, you know, we're getting there, but, you know, we, we knew as a, as an institution that our board did not reflect our community. And so, you know, spots come up on the board and they're, you know, they don't come up that often, a couple of years, you know, these things are built to stay. Um, and, you know, you look around and the old rules were, you know, had to be in a, had to be a member, had to be on a committee. Would be ideal if they were, you know, generous to the library. Right. And those are all totally valid. But if you follow those rules, you end up with a board that never changes. Um, you've got to, you've got to, you got to jump. You got to say, you know what? This person's great. This person isn't even a member of the library, but I know he or she loves books. And I know she has brought friends here. I know like this place is great. Huh. Um, so you have to look at it differently and say, you know, very intentionally, we're going to make this change. We've got three spots coming up and we did this. Uh, we did this and we had spots coming up on the board and the board president and I were like, we need, we, we need black people on our board. Speaking frankly, we like, because one isn't enough. One sucks. <laughs> one is. So, there's another question. So John, you bring up this point. Jen, I want to get you in on this because without over essentializing the quality you need as a leader, um, it's just, it's bravery. And so when I encounter leaders who are sort of wedged between the lie, right? Perpetuating the lie and the truth. And they're trying to mediate that space. Yeah. The, the difference between sort of staying, you know, careening back and forth and using that bravery and truth telling to propel your institution into a completely new state to me is bravery. So Jen, as you are coaching institutions and their principal leaders, what else do you tell them they need to step into their truth and be brave? I think um, acknowledgement mm. is the first step. Uh, I think, John, that was the advice that I gave you. Yep. It is acknowledgement of the past. Whatever that past is, first acknowledging that it existed. Whether or not it was the truth of some people or the truth of all people, there is a story there and acknowledgement uh, first and foremost. Uh, the second step that I think is really important, and you touched on this, uh, many organizations, and so I'm going to talk about the easy way out that, you know, John was just mentioning, you can statement, put out statements, you can uh, come up with principles, you can facilitate conversations, but organizations are hosting, oh, did I cut out? Yeah, yeah. you're off. Okay, many organizations are hosting conversations and calling them safe conversations. Uh, I've instructed any leader that I'm working with not to refer to these conversations as conversations of safety because safety is relative. And what is safe to you may not be safe to someone else. And even though you can create a, a container of uh, a, a manufactured safety in that room, when that independent individual goes back out into the work unit, when they go back out into the broader organization, that is not a community of safety and that container is then gone. So those are acts of bravery that carry with them badges, be it badges of honor and how you acknowledge your bravery and speaking your truth to power and understanding that that will be carried with you as you engage with other people that may have been in the room, other people that may have been on a call, other people that may have very different views, opinions, and values than you do, you still wear that badge, mm -hmm. right? And so understanding that those are acts of bravery that should be treated as such. That is not just everybody coming together to sing Kumbaya that many folks have, uh, 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 you know, kind of leaned into traditional diversity and inclusion programs. Oh, we celebrate, you know, uh, uh, Africa or Black History Month. We celebrate Pride Month. 
where are you the other 364 days of the year or outside of February or outside of the month of June? How are you looking not to support those people, but standing in solidarity with all people, understanding that this is not their struggle, it's our struggle. Mm. Um, and so with that, I think that, you know, the acknowledgement, uh, realizing that, you know, again, safety is relative. Acts of bravery don't just occur in that moment, but you carry that with you. And understanding that the retaliation that individuals may face and experience is real. And if you are an organization that has not put safeguards in place to account for that, to ensure that people that are uh, uh, standing up and uh, committing acts of bravery are then protected and ensuring that they are seen and continue to be uh, valued and brought along in a process versus just you know serving as a space to kind of bear your truth and then what happens? Mm -hmm. If you aren't looking at in, intentionally creating next steps, I'm advising organizations not to open the can if you're not gonna look at using that to pave a path towards a more equitable and inclusive future. Mm. So G, let me ask you this. Let me, let me pick up the mic first. Well, the, let me pick up the mic first. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if she's doing it on purpose, but she's- Check to see if it still works, but G, I don't like your chances. We can't, we can't keep picking up these mics, Jen, come on now. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll speak after G. <laughs> I want to have a question here. Um, so what I'm hearing, so basically what you're saying, Jen, is that truth telling is sequential, right? It's not linear, right? It has this kind of feel up and down to it. And so in, in my mind, it means there's a process. And, um, you know, one of my friends, Quinita Roberson, uh, Robertson, she says, you know, you can either take the hard way or the easy way. Which way do you want to choose? Pick one. <laughs> when you're taking a pathway towards truth telling, you have to buy into the process. So, G, let me ask you this. As an artist, like what, how, how do you break down your process? Because I imagine you, you've got this idea, this big idea you want to convey on a canvas. Or for you, it's charcoal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how does that truth unfold in your artistic process? You know, I think for me, the subject that I tend to focus on, the truth tends to unfold by acknowledging the lie, right? Wow. And, 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 and um, allowing my creative pursuit to be a pursuit that is one in which is intended to hunt down, sniff out the lie, track it down and put it to sleep through, through a creative um, drawing our, our are a piece of work that tends to be my own my own truth, um, and I think with that the beautiful thing about you know an artist uh, or any creative is like we have we have the creative freedom and we have some elements that we can utilize that are different from other people like imagination. I can I can really I can really tap into this whole space of imagination and go to places that not a lot of people can go to in the pursuit of creating my work. And for me personally, that process is a process in which involves truth. It involves um, digging deep and asking questions. A lot of my work uh, involves research. It's tons of research, tons of learning. That's why I tend to study like people like James Baldwin, who and Toni Morrison, who aren't, aren't they're not visual artists, but their but their approach to to telling a story or to offering a narrative is so similar to mine's. And and from my research, their process involves deconstructing lies. Mm. And, and that is what I tend to, I've been doing it and not even knowing it. And honestly, until we start having this conversation, I'm like, damn, is this what I've been doing? I've been really trying to hunt down lies and tell them through a way in which it's truth. And um, I think I do that as well as other creators as well. Not even just artists, but I think Jen does it when she's, when she's assessing organizations and she's really sniffing through the bullshit, and trying to get to the truth, right? And I think that's just a, it's a, it's just a fact of uh, it's just how we all function. I'm, John does it as well, you know, and it's just a matter of just how can you utilize, how can you get to the lie through, how can you get to the truth through sniffing through the lie? Uh, so I want to talk about what it means.
means to, to educate. Um, a, a colleague of mine framed it in a really beautiful way. He talked about the, the equity journey that we're all on. And some people aren't even on the chessboard, right? Some people don't even register the work we're trying to do. We're not worried about them, right? We're worried about the people who are at least on the chessboard. And so how can we in our truth telling and our equity work bring people along on that truth telling journey in a way that educates them and doesn't alienate them? And so my question for you, John, is, man, what do you do when you've got stakeholders? I mean, like stakeholders, <laughs> a lot invested. They love the library and they love everything you stand for. And yet, they may or may not be on your chessboard. What do you do to take well, them along on your journey? How, how do you conceive of that process? Um, I mean, oh, I feel a little, I mean, I, I, this is a little awkward. Like I'm the white guy and <laughs> I'm talking about how great I am. Um, I think, and I, you know, I've heard black people, African-American people saying this forever. You gotta be twice as good. <laughs> so we really, uh, at the library, I thought our duty, the way we could change things, the way we could, like if you're gonna bring in a voice that maybe hasn't been heard recently at the library, if you're gonna, um, that person has to be extraordinary. Like, you can't bring in, if you really want to change hearts and minds of, of both sides, you can't bring in pretty good black guy. You got to bring in amazing black guy. Now, which is a different standard. Um, but so we brought in just over the last couple of years, I was thinking of this, like Claudia Rankin, who is spectacular. Chuck D, Zadie Smith, Kaisi Lehman came in. He was our last big event this year. He wrote Heavy. It's an amazing memoir. Um, Michelle Alexander was here right at the start. I didn't pick her. My predecessor picked her. Uh, Ibram Kendi was coming in June of this year. He'll be there in June and next year. So these people are extraordinary. So like... I mean, part of this drives me nuts because basically I think what you're asking is like, how do we make this change without, you know, upsetting people? Well, you know, that's hard. You have to upset people. And why, like, that's that power structure still weighing down on you. Like, how do we do this without, you know, pissing him off or pissing her off? Maybe they need to be angered. Maybe they need to be angered. Uh, that part of this conversation drives me nuts. It, it's realistic. It's the truth. You, you do have to do it. Um, well, I, I think I you need to acknowledge it. Yeah, I, I think you eventually got there. Um, I didn't ask the question right because I'm very clear that in order to do this work well, <laughs> there are going to be people who just aren't with you. And our job is frankly to work with the people who want to do the work. I mean, we were talking about limited time resources. We have to put our energy and prioritize the people who are, are ready to roll up their sleeves and do the work and who have enough curiosity about the work to stay the course of the work. So it's, that's fascinating to me. Jen, can you talk about what you see in your consulting work, especially in the nonprofit realm, right? So, so th this is an interesting dichotomy in the nonprofit realm. On one hand, we're seen as like the social good industry, right? On the other hand, we have some undeniably poisonous intersections with inequity, you know? Um, how does that show up when you, with your clients and how do you advise them to take people along the journey who are ready? Who may, but, but, but they may need some education though. I think that looking along a continuum to understand where, oh. Jen, could you explain exactly what it is you do and who your clients typically are not not the names of them but like what time of companies you're working with that'll help sure absolutely uh and honestly i have clients in every industry pretty much ranging from for-profit not-for-profit uh funders um 
-hmm. government. Um, and so even the most recent uh, uh, orders uh, from the White House have impacted my work in limiting what we can talk about and how that looks. Um, so really, uh, really runs the gamut. And that's one of the things that I think differentiates me from, you know, other consultants. Uh, not to say that, and I won't go down a rabbit hole, other than saying I've been inside of organizations uh, as large as 65,000 with a national presence, as small as shy of 100 doing this work. So understanding what it means to actually engage stakeholders along that journey and to bring people along to educate folks to look at, you know, having a critical mass in some spaces uh, uh, and not in others. Uh, what it means to push a boulder up a hill for organizations that perhaps signed off for something that they didn't know that they were signing on for when they said that they believed in racial equity uh, and those who may have, you know, not known that. Uh, and so understanding, you know, uh, uh, what that looks like, um, you know, Naima, back to your original question. Um, ask me the question again, because I think I want to go someplace different than I initially was headed. Yeah, so it's just um, as, a, as a leader, how do you coach your clients to bring people along in a way that educates and doesn't alienate? But I'm talking about a very specific type of yeah. person who maybe need some education to join you on your journey. I'm not talking about people who need to be convinced that racism and white supremacy exist. <laughs> right, absolutely. And I think that is, the first, that is the first factor to understand is where are people? What is the lens that they are using uh, to assess your policies that they're advising on, their your practices that they are uh, providing insight on? And so understanding where someone sits uh, is not something that you can assess or gather about that individual if you are engaged in transactional relationships. If you are not looking at who people are and bringing the fullness of who they are into a space, then you're falling short. As it relates to what it looks like to bring people along in a journey, I think that organizations that, are, that want to do this work, if you want to stay in a feel-good space and you don't want to ruffle feathers, don't start doing racial equity work don't do equity work. I started by saying diversity is intentional, inclusion or diversity is happening, inclusion is intentional and equity is deliberate. If you are not willing to lose some folks along the way, if you are not willing to stick to a, a narrative of truth that upholds the truth, then don't start down the path. Where organizations tend to get into trouble is when they acknowledge uh, a, something that is true. We acknowledge that racism exists. But are you acknowledging the full truth of how you may be upholding or perpetuating a racist system? I think that it is important to understand what is true versus the full truth and what you are signing on for, uh, especially in this current climate. Right, many organizations are being reactive, but this is not another flavor of the month thing that you can be reactive to. You will either see organizations experience brand damage uh, by saying that they believe in something and then two days later, they may say that there aren't enough people in a certain pipeline, there's not enough, enough people of color, right? Uh, but, you believe, but you believe that racism is real, right? <laughs> And so again, when you get into these fragmented ways, if you are perpetuating or pushing out sound bites without actually looking at doing the work. Uh, so part of the work that I do is educating folks and bringing folks along. The other part of it is risk mitigation and harm reduction. It is harmful to start down a path and say that you're doing something to get buy-in of people of color, of folks that you know maybe from other underrepresented groups within your organization, and then to say, oh, we didn't mean that we meant this. That right. is harmful, right? Uh, but also looking at mitigating risk, right? And if you are an organization that is not willing to take the risk of losing some stakeholders, of losing some donors, of you know necessarily you know being viewed as a certain way because of the stance that you are taking in inequities, then you're missing the mark, and you actually stand the risk of damaging your brand uh, beyond repair in some instances. Cancel culture is real. Um, not and you know some of the work that I do is helping organizations not end up on a cancel culture list. But beyond that, the last point that I want to make, Naima is really highlighting the way in which uh, nonprofits especially have professionalized and created intentional barriers by way of education requirements and other things that uh, truly limit the pool of potential folks that could be doing the work. 
This is work that was done in churches. This was work that was done by block clubs. This was work that was done in other communal fashions long before we saw this complex that we now see where we have professionalized uh, uh, the roles within nonprofit organizations. And so often what we see are individuals that are treated as if they are less than, right? Not treated with respect and dignity. And it's not necessarily any one individual that's doing that, that something, right? It's not about being a good person or I believe in helping other people, right? That goes back to this notion of solidarity, right? If you are in a nonprofit and you are not operating out of solidarity for the people that you serve, you are not doing the work and you're missing the mark and you're not doing equity work. I'm sorry to say that. If you were in the, do you want me to stop now? No, I'm just, I'm looking, you don't understand. I am like dropping the mics as, the, as they come to prevent them from hitting the floor, but please continue. The last thing, but no, I just wanted to wrap this uh, piece up by highlighting the importance as nonprofits look to do work within community. Are you of community? Mm. Are you, are you rooted in community? Are you seeking the expertise and valuing those with lived experience as experts? Are you valuing their expertise in a way in which is compensated, right? Are you valuing them as people and their lived experience as something that you can not just learn from and write down, but as truly providing insight into the policies, the practices, the procedures that are taking place and impacting them, if not at this point, by way of the uh, how they receive services. So we can't just look at one point along a continuum. We've got to understand the full cycle of what it means to be employed by a nonprofit, to go into community or helicopter in and out of community, while also looking at the people that are there left holding the trauma that has been perpetuated for generations. That is generational trauma in many instances that has gone ignored and unaddressed. And if you have a focus on racial equity and you're not talking about generational trauma, you're not doing the work. Mm. I, can we just, seriously, I think we need a beat to take that in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Um, we're going to ask um, our friend Megan or Claire to drop the link in the chat because you just need to call Jen. Jen will get you really straight. Um, G, I can tell that you want to get in on this. Talk to me. Well, <laughs> you know, I want to go back to your, to your initial question of John when you talked about bringing people along. Uh -huh. um, and then you said something about a, a chessboard. I don't want to make sure I screw that up, but uh, a lot of it resonates to me because like this, you know, since January, well, since July 1, I've I've been a full-time artist. I've mm -hmm. been I've been living and creating every day. And I don't have to wake up and worry about anybody really, other than the fact of my family and what I what projects I'm working on. And it is it is an incredible feeling. Mm -hmm. I I for, for those who do not know me, before this new life, I spent a number of years in the corporate space, interacting with a number of industries. Um, so I know what Jen is talking about when she's talking about this nonprofit world and organizations talking about, they just can't find, we have a shortage in talent. I, 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 I've heard it, I've seen it, I've, I've been at the tables. Um, so, to, to listen to you ask that question around um, how do you bring people along? I wanted to answer it first because right now I don't fucking have to. Mm. And it feels so good to be in that space now where before my role required, required me to maintain relation, relationships, establish relationships on behalf of the organization in which I served. I'm still doing that, but I'm I'm doing them on behalf of G. Horton. And because of that, those relationships are developed and maintained and they're genuine. Not to say that those ones before was disingenuine, but I had a role and I was I had to I had I had a job to do. And 
and the beautiful thing about right now living in the space as an artist is, you know, relationships still drive the world, but in terms of bringing people along for the sake of creativity, I don't have to create for anyone other than myself. And that is such a liberating feeling to be in that space, um, to not even give a fuck about the chessboard, right? To, to, to transition from um, that to this is, in my opinion, uh, a definition of living in the truth or living in some, some element of what the truth can be or what it feels like. And that truth can eventually become tainted once if, if you decide or if I decide to start to create on behalf of someone else. And I think that's what happens with a lot of creatives. Yeah. You know, they tend to create and they lose an element of creativity because they're doing work for other people mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of other people, which is no different from a simple, you know, a job. Um, so uh, yeah, go ahead. I've, I've told you this before. I mean, you know, I look at your story. And I don't even know why I didn't start with this because it's kind of like a microcosm of our whole conversation. You, G, at some point said, no, my North Star is telling me I don't belong in the corporate space. Let me listen to my truth and follow that truth. And the kind of transformation, I mean, you were always an artist, um, but the kind of transformation I've seen in you, like I see li like liberation all over you. You know, it was like you drip liberation at this point. Um, and that is so inspirational. And it, it, it gives me inspiration too, because we can all seek that truth and we can do what we can to align our vocation with that North Star. It's something I, I'm thinking about myself every day. Mm -hmm. So as for John, I, because to know your story too, people just need to go online and read about your story. Tell me what inspires you about this work and how does it keep the spark? How does it keep you going? And I, I guess really the question is, where is your hope in this work, doing what you do? Um, I think we have, I think libraries as a rule have an obligation to their community I mean, we're not gas stations. We're not stores selling clothes. There's nothing the matter with those, but they don't really have an obligation to change the culture of a community. Uh, I get really inspired by bringing voices to the library that haven't been heard, that need to be heard. Um, and practically I'm inspired by saying, bringing these voices in isn't just the right thing to do morally. It's also the right thing to do for this library. Um, you know, it took me a while to get past the same thing that everyone gets past. We'll do this because it's the right thing. Well, I stopped thinking that way. That's how I started. But you do this because it's, the library is better, bigger, more diverse. And it, it changed, we changed and we became better. We didn't change and become worse and we didn't suffer um, from doing the right thing. Sometimes doing the right thing sucks because it's like, it involves sacrifice. There's no sacrifice in this. It's like, just do it. Mm. Um, you're better off and so is your organization. It's, mm. we have to change the way we think of, 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 this being a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, so what inspires me, what inspires me is to like kind of bring in places, bring in people and our membership, I mean, COVID really monkeyed with a lot of stuff, but our membership before was higher than it had ever been. And our members were more diverse and, and younger. Um, we were, there were people coming to events there were people sitting at the tables. So mm. I'm inspired by trying to do the right thing, but having fun along the way and trying to make sure that people know this does not involve hardship. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things Jen told me too, 
Well, I mean, but there there is a certain, there has to be some uplift in the work we do. I mean, I have to think, well, you know, I don't even want to, to um, imagine what that work is like. I'm just going to ask Jen, <laughs> how do you find uplift and joy in what you do? And what keeps, I guess, the, the, um, the fires of passion burning in your work in a hopeful way every day? I think that's a wonderful question. I think it varies day by day. Um, I think it's first understanding who I am and how I show up to this work understanding what fuels me and drives me and it's not a paycheck it never has been um, it is my life's purpose to positively impact the lives of others by advancing equity and inclusion i'm not a diversity and inclusion person i'm not uh, uh, just a chief diversity officer or any of these other titles i'm an equity and inclusion evangelist and that is the title that was given to me and when i say evangelist i say that by way of the old microsoft term of evangelism right sharing the good news and engaging folks in a process mm -hmm. and so what gives me hope is realizing that the actions that each and every one of us take today will become the history of tomorrow it is holding up mirrors and reflecting the truth of past days, past movements, and understanding that there were a lot of people that were known and many of whom, more of whom were unknown, that led to the incremental glacial pace of progress that we have seen so far and understanding that we still have so much farther to go and that this won't stop within my lifetime. And understanding that I can do what I can do and I can do what I can to educate those that are coming behind me firm believer in the old, of the old African proverb that, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? But understanding that, also knowing that I stand on the shoulders of giants. When I am standing here with you and I am delivering a message, I'm not just delivering my story. I'm delivering the story of my great grandparents that fled racial terrorism in the Jim Crow South and became refugees in the city of Detroit where we were raised. Uh, the community that is still experiencing blight uh, to this day, right? I, I think that it's so important to understand all of the nuances and the things that are at play. We're in a different space in that the cloak, that invisible cloak of the lie is being removed. It is being removed by uh, uh, institutions and people in positions of power. They are peeling back the layers, be it by force, by protest, or any other means necessary. They are removing the cloak of the lie in an attempt to highlight and share the truth. Mm -hmm. right? and, and within that sharing of the truth, what can I do to be a positive catalyst for the change that I know needs to happen? How can I use the experiences, both my own lived experiences, the experiences that have been gained doing this work within organizations, but also my individual passions uh, for this work to help to drive this work across many organizations, but beyond the organizations to inspire others, to inspire communities, to activate and giving them a pathway and a blueprint by which you can do this and assess your progress over time. Uh, so one of the things G mentioned was the, the liberation. You, you mentioned he's dripping in liberation. I totally agree. Uh, and when I left and started, decided to start my own company, I speak for Jen Ingram now. I speak for Calibrated Lens. There is no filter or limitation for what I can say on behalf of an organization. On one side of an equation, there is fear. There's a bridge in between of faith. And on the other side, there is freedom. One of the questions that you asked were, was around you know, individuals within organizations that you know, may be uh, uh, interested in continuing on with telling the truth. What I would say is know the environment that you are in and is truth telling valued in that space. Is that container a container that will hear and appreciate and do something with the truth? If not, you will end up frustrated and feeling, you know, I won't go down that path, but all of the things that you will experience will not be because of you and your truth was not valid or because your worth could not be ascribed to whatever North Star, some institution or some committee or some group attempted to place on you. Instead, it's the space. Yeah. Know who you are, remain anchored in that. So I, um, I have been negligent because we have a whole bunch of audience questions just pinging away and I have not asked not narrow one. So we're going to do some now. Um, first of all, you guys, I, <laughs> we need to have a little like chat after this because I am feeling so fired up right now. 
just hearing you talk about that liberation, what it feels like to speak for yourself. And Jen, you said something so important is like, know your limit because we go into systems hoping to change them and they chew us up and they spit us out. We have to preserve ourselves. So first question from the audience, I wanna remind everybody listening, watching, participating, drop your questions in the chat. Um, this question is, can power accept the truth? That's a big one. I'm gonna throw that to G. Can power accept truth? It seems like a simple question. Um, shit, no. <laughs> I think um, I think people in general struggle with the truth. Uh. I think it's much easier to live a lie than the truth, honestly. Um, you know, Jen and I talk about this freedom and, and we dress it up It's sexy, but it's a grind. It is, it is, it is on the, on the flip side of it, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people are wired that way. Not a lot of people um, even pursue to live life um, through that lens. If we're speaking on the individual level, yeah. um, but I, I, I answer it that way as a, as a reflection of how we're wired individually, but how that trickles into society. I just think in general, we're afraid of the truth. We're afraid to, to tell the truth, we're afraid to live in the truth. And that's why I think the work of artists is so important mm. because some of us, we blur the lines. And in, in the job, like I said earlier, earlier on the talk was uh, our role is to really sniff out the lie and blow it up mm. through an artistic lens. Um, so to answer that question, I. I, I think if if it was true, this conversation would, would look different. It'll feel different. Absolutely. Um, but the reality, and especially as a black man in America, no, nah, power mm -hmm. came out of the truth. Mm. Well, okay. So I think power would tell the truth if they saw that puppy. <laughs> <laughs> that puppy will disarm any any power structure. All right, um, John. This next question is for you. <laughs> What does truth telling and equity look like from your perspective as the administrator of a library that requires paid membership? And there's a second part to that question, which is how does inclusion work in an environment with an element of exclusivity? So I think they're, they're tying, making a, a, a tie or a link between paid membership and exclusivity here. How, how, do, how do you conceive that? Yeah, well, it's a good question. It's a fair question. Um, you know, we don't have as many, we don't have nearly as many books as the public library. Um, so I can't, I can't pretend we're a better library. And, and we do have to ask what are the benefits of this, uh, of, of it being a, a, a membership, a club of sorts. Um, I, yeah, I mean, every year we, every year we talk about like, you know, every year we're making a budget, same as any other organization. And, you know, how do we get more in, how do we, you know, we need more income, we need more income, we need more income. And, um, I know I feel really strongly and I know actually my board feels really strongly as well as that we have to keep the, we have to keep the, uh, lowest level of membership and and to be honest there's no real difference between the highest level of membership and the lowest level of membership it's just an opportunity to give us more money um a 55 dollar membership you are treated exactly the same as our 1500 dollar membership there's no difference uh, and we have really kept it low we have kept that number at 55 it's it's been 55 for the five years i've been there and it will be 55 for as long as I'm there, we will not raise that up. Um, and I, I, you know, this is awkward too. But like, if someone comes and says, "Man, I love this place," but that's a hard nut for me, you know, I would of course say, "Well, come on in, man. Don't worry about it. We, we'll figure that out later. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe next year you're, maybe next year you're rich." <laughs> um, but that's a really hard, you know, that's a conversation someone has to go through. So just because the answer is going to be yes, doesn't mean the question's easy to ask. Right. Um, and, 
you know, frankly, I don't think we were as welcoming as we should have been. Uh, mm. You know, we, we needed to be better and we weren't better. We're better now, um, but we're not perfect. You know, you, one of the reasons, I mean, one of the reasons I was so excited to meet G, you know, I saw his work and I knew he was, and I, I met him, I'm like, well, this is just a great guy. This is a guy I can work with, this is easy. But like, and G and I have spoken about this, but like our library was, you know, as welcoming as possible. But if that picture, that if you look behind you, I'll, I'll, I'll be part of the myth of where Naima really is. Yeah. Um, Every picture in there, every image in there is of a white person. And we got like three George Washingtons. <laughs> One's plenty. Um, so G's job for the library, what he's doing is he is making this huge portrait of our first African-American member from um, the 1800s and uh, Peter H. Clark, um, I, I'm off path, but we, we needed to be, so the biggest piece of art in the library, whenever, whenever G decides he wants to be done with this project, and I'm kidding, I told him to take his time because we want to have a big party when he's done with the project and we can't have a big party for mm -hmm. six months, 12 months, so we'll wait, but we need to be more welcome visually. And whenever that portrait goes up, you're gonna walk through the door, it's gonna be, you're gonna be confronted with it. Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, when we hang the little plaque, you know, there's always a little plaque next to a piece of art. Uh, it's gonna tell the truth of his admission to the library, which parts of it were really beautiful. And parts of it were like so ugly, you couldn't believe it. Like when, I mean, when Peter H. Clark was invited to be a member of the library, like a handful, a healthy handful of board members were like, they're not all welcome now. Mm. You know, the one is good. Mm. Um, mm. That, that was 140 years ago. We're better, but the truth will be uh, like, we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not going to be like, oh, here's our Jackie. You know, um, it's a good question. I mean, we've tried to add value. It, it's hard to monkey with the numbers. It's hard to lower them. They're pretty damn low. 55 bucks, 90 for a family. Listen, if you're broke, you're broke. And that's a hard number. I get it. Mm -hmm. But if you're anything other than broke, you could probably get there. Um, I think we have failed not in the uh, not in the barriers to admission. I don't think we've failed nearly as much as we have in the you know telling our story to more people and making sure people feel more welcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's the difference between what's true and what's the truth. Because the truth, what's true is we were always happy to have a black member. Anyone, any black person who walked up to that counter, welcome aboard. Yeah. And we meant it, like sincerely. But we didn't go, we didn't say to that person, hey, where'd you come from? How can I speak to you? How can I speak to more people? How can I, you know, how can, how can I make sure people know that they're welcome and then actually make them welcome and then make sure that they have programming that they're interested in. Uh, I told you guys before we had Chuck D come to the library and I was like, we have made it. We have changed. Woohoo. Wow. The people in the, and there were 700 people there that day. I mean, that was an extraordinary number. And about 680, 690 of them are white. Um, for Chuck D. So I was like, okay. And it was a real wake up call for me. I was like, all right, <laughs> we did the right thing. 
kind of, you know, we did the right thing, but like, if we didn't communicate what we were doing or we didn't communicate it properly, or we didn't figure out how to talk to people who might be interested in Chuck D who weren't like guys like me who love, you know, I've been listening to Chuck D since I was in high school. So it was everyone in my suburban Chicago neighborhood, <laughs> but that event, that was a real wake up call for me. That was like, oh shit, mm. uh, did everything right nothing changed. So did we really do anything right? And the answer was no. The answer was we haven't communicated properly to the right people. Mm. Uh, it was a wake up call and you know, yeah. it was a big success that had some real cracks in it. Um, it knew it. Oh boy, I mean, Chuck, <laughs> Chuck knew who was there and he was not surprised one bit. I mean, but it, you know, it's a journey. And that, this is why I love talking about it as like an equity journey, a truth telling journey. Uh, this next question is actually for emerging leaders. So younger leaders, I'm gonna throw this to Jen. Talk about fear a little. <laughs> what the hell just happened? <laughs> That's called the, the pivot. Um, I want to make sure we've got some good audience questions here, John. Let, let's get to them so we can get you another one. Um, I, I, wa I, wanna, uh, I wanna give this question to Jen because this is talking about young emerging leaders or just even emerging leaders, just forget about age. Um, and they, they might be wondering in the audience, you know, I'm afraid to use my voice. I've got a job, I've got a family. If I speak out, there might be consequences to that. How? How have you been able to shake your fear in speaking truth to power and adding rigor to truth telling as an emerging leader? I remember uh, early in my career being afraid, right? I remember, um, you know, doing certain things and, you know, not speaking up in meetings and being afraid of what somebody might say or how they might perceive me. Um, what I can say is that First, knowing who you are and where you are and whose you are and how and why you do what you do. Um, and I know that sounds like a lot, but the more clear you become, the more you are able to start to share your truth. Always start with yourself, right? Uh, but also understand the environment by which you are sharing. Uh, I think that it's really important to understand that not all leaders have a vision that would allow or uh, support you in becoming uh, all that you may have the potential to be. And understanding what it means to look beyond mentorship, but developing true relationships with folks that don't look like you. Share your lived experience, be vulnerable with people that you feel are trustworthy. I can't tell you how many, you know, along the, the course of my career, white men that I have been open and vulnerable with and shared my experience. And in turn, I've been sponsored. I've been supported. And I think that it comes down to, you know, looking, of course, at experiences, but realizing that each of us, you know, got to where we are with help from someone. And, and in order to continue to make that journey, um, establish trusting relationships, seek guidance and counsel. Uh, anybody that knows me well, especially folks that I respect, I'll, I'll be the first person to say that, you know, listen, I rely heavily on people that have turned more corners than I have in neighborhoods I'm looking to learn. Mm -hmm. and, and in understanding what it means to seek counsel uh, from folks. Uh, beyond that, as it relates to, you know, being a young leader, be fearless. I'm going to quote my good friend, uh, Andre Williams in saying positive disruption, mm. be agitators, go into systems and structures and be the agitator. But if it's not a space of safety, right, that's relative. I'm going to use that term. But if it's not a space that values bravery, understand the potential risk and be prepared, be prepared to either, you know, step out, and whatever the consequences may be, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, be an agitator. When you see something, do something, mm -hmm. right? I think that we've normalized this term of allyship. 
don't be an ally. Become an accomplice. Stand in solidarity. And, and, and don't allow these normalized terms. Another one that out there out there is, you know, looking at getting proximate to issues and sharing. Mm -hmm. I think the more that we're able to, I go back to rem removing the veil of, of the lie and tell the truth and standing your truth with dignity, with respect, and not seeking validation from external forces to share with you who you know you are. I think that one of the things that you know we oftentimes seek is um, especially looking at opportunities for promotion, right? Are you going along to get along in a system that you know is significantly flawed? I'll just say that. And if so, you are upholding and perpetuating the status quo that could very well be harming others. Are you stepping over as a means to getting over and realizing that it doesn't go away? I think that one of the things that, you know, if you're a young leader, you think that if you get to this level, then you can influence and impact change. It only gets harder. The power dynamics get stronger. The chokehold is real. And it gets to a space where you may even feel like you physically can't breathe. So it doesn't get easier the higher you go. So, so I, this is a question I, I want to ask the three of you, which is you talk about this chokehold. So so if you're in a chokehold position, and I, I know that this is um, in some ways maybe triggering for some people, but I'm, I'm trying to use it in the sense of your, your use of the, the phrase. Um, how do you create a sense of urgency when there is is this chokehold, right? So this incrementalism, this is what the, a great question from the audience is asking. You know, once you reach a leadership place, there's a sense that you gotta be moderated. So you do too much too fast, suddenly you have a vote of no confidence from your board and you're out, right? Um, so how do you create urgency, G, as a leader? Yeah, I, I think that question partially ties into the question Jen just answered. Yeah. Um, and I want to approach it from that perspective because I, I feel like I am in that emerging leader. If there's even, if you can categorize me, right? <laughs> Someone will say, well, he's an emerging leader, whatever the hell that means. But I do think as it relates to that question, Naima, um, Jen said a lot of great things, but one, one of the things that she said that really resonated with me, and she didn't quite touch on it, um, I think is real is finding your voice like finding your voice and and I mean that literally I mean that metaphorically like find your voice I think so and I'm and I'm talking sp specifically specifically right now to our emerging leaders of colors I think too many times too often times and I'm guilty of it our voice switches it literally changes it code switches based on proximity, who we're surrounded by. I do it, I've, I've done it, I continue to do it, but it's me trying to, if we're talking the truth, I'm trying to phase out of that because so often I was doing it subconsciously. And I think as you continue to climb and merge, people can see through that. And uh, I think my point is, as an emerging leader, before you get to that, whatever that destination or place is, along the path, you have to figure out what your voice is, hone it, channel it, because in that leadership position, you're going to be, you're going to have to use it. So um, just yeah, tying, that tying that question back to what Jen said, yeah. I, I think right now is the time. And I, I remind myself all the time, like, G, are you being you? Go ahead, John. I think you guys are both right, but I have, I have so much empathy, as I'm sure you guys do as well, for like the person, particularly a person who had particular challenges that were thrust upon him because he's black, because she's black, whatever. And then they, they make it and they're tired. Mm. And, you know, their mom's proud of them. And like, there's just like, I mean, you guys are a hundred percent right, but it's it's so unfair. Like you just want to be like, man, you did it. You you made it. You're you're top of your class at your medical school, and here you go. And but now it's like, all right, you fought through all that. 
you made it. Now look, here's more. Now, now you gotta, that's just like another burden for black po folks. And that like, no one says that to a white guy. No one says, hey, you made it. Now who are you gonna bring up behind you? Uh -huh. it's, like, it's like, you know, I got mine, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Like, and the people behind me, they're gonna get theirs too. I mean, it's just, it's such a, it's, it's gotta be exhausting. It's like, you made it, you did it. You fought unfairness and now you gotta do more. Jen? On the other, Jim, before you go ahead and, and, and body slam at home, let me touch on this. On the <laughs> other side, on the other side of that, John, too, is like there's this element of, of guilt. Yeah. Guilt. Like, it's damn, so I made it out. I have a responsibility to uplift. Right. And, and that can weigh on a person's psyche as well. Uh, it's just ahead. so much weight. Like, <laughs> yeah, and let me have it. So there's a piece that I'm going to ask to be dropped into the chat. Um, I wrote a piece uh, that details all of this uh, in there, it, uh, exploring differences, reducing harm, evolving strategies. It's a white paper that my firm put out uh, over the summer that talks about this double consciousness, how we are expected to and conditioned and taught to uh, you know, be one way in one space and another way in another space and what the variance and experiences look like. But what, what I want to say is that it is not just uh, exhausting, uh, but there is no safety net, right? You are free falling with no safety net, with a million people looking at you, looking down and hoping that you will not fall, right? to wear the weight and the burden of your race, be it within an institution or be it your family or your community, it is not just a weight, it is a, 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 a tax, mm -hmm. right? That is carried in any space you show up in. I think that, you know, looking at what it means to have to segment out parts and pieces of yourself to deem what is most socially acceptable in this setting is a is a is a, a, a not just a skill but a means of survival that we have been employing since we were trying to escape plantations mm. so I, I think that it's important to understand that it's just it's the same it's just evolved and it looks differently now um but realizing that the same tactics that were used to avoid getting caught be same, became the same tax, tactics that were used to avoid getting lynched became the same tactics that were used to avoid being fired were the same tactics and are the same tactics that people are bobbing and weaving around right now to stay employed while not coming off as too black or too this or too that. So I think that, you know, John, you opened up the door. Uh, and this is a space that we don't talk about. And as we look at our diversity and inclusion programs, we're not bringing the rawness and the authentic experience of the compromise of assimilation to uphold comfort of a dominant culture, which is what it is. So there's yeah. something that you said there. I, you know, I, I read this article recently that talked about you can you can measure the health of a country's democracy not by the people who are protected, but by the people who aren't protected. And I think institutions can measure the health of their institutions by seeing how people are treated who are under protect under protected and underrepresented. So, and I, I'm partial because I'm 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 black. The last time I checked. I'm a black woman and I, I think uh, a really good focus group is black women. Check in with black women to see how they're doing. And that'll give you a really, really <laughs> um, good sample set as to how, you know, how you're doing on your journey. Um, there's one more question that we got from the audience and I know there, <laughs> we could go on and on and on about this topic. This is for Jen, what organizations we're about to put people on right now. Okay, you ready? What organizations in Cincinnati are leading the way in this work? And I think by this work, we can, we can assume they're talking about equity work, right? Racial justice, social justice. Not, and it's interesting, they say, it's not who's getting it right. They're asking who's leading the way. 
Yeah, I think that uh, first defining what does leading the way mean? Mm -hmm. What are the um, uh, uh, indicators of leaders uh, uh, from an institutional perspective? I would say that it is organizations that are not backing down from uh, support, Mm -hmm. but moving beyond support to investment. Who are the organizations that are allocating dollars? Uh, And when you look at dollars, I mean that by way of looking at overall operating budget (laughs) and the 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 percentage of dollars that they are advocating or that they are directing at uh, racial equity work and not just explicit racial equity work but to doing things differently to Mm -hmm. investing in communities and to areas that have been under invested in right understanding that this is not a people issue but it's a systemic issue And without dollars, we can all have great ideas and great thoughts, but we know that it takes resources. I know that I didn't directly answer that question and saying what organizations, but I would also say that it is institutions that are looking in the mirror and reflecting on their past ills and that are acknowledging those things while trying to move forward. It is the organizations that are, as John mentioned, acknowledging the fact that you know, we had uh, a, we had board members that, you know, said that, you know, he can be the only or we don't we don't want all people of color. We don't want all black people, you know, just some. Right. It is the acknowledgement, not just of what happened 100 years ago, but things that happened last week, things that happened last year and the, the newness of what it looks like to uphold dominant culture. Uh, and I think that organizations that are transparent that are forthcoming and beyond being transparent and forthcoming, I would also say organizations that when you look at them, they are hiring differently. They are promoting differently. And beyond hiring and promoting differently, they are seeking and allowing uh, 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 voices that maybe historically have not been at the table to guide the ship, not to give feedback on and to give feedback on something after it's created, but to co-create with those that they may seek to engage or to do business with. Mm. So I realized that, you know, that is, uh, I, I don't have an individual organization that I would call out, but I would say those are some indicators that you can look for uh, in organizations to see uh, how they are doing the work. Mm. Well, um, thank you for giving us a, a roadmap because sometimes you, you just got to look for the indicators, as you said, right? That'll be a great guide for all of us. Um, I want to close it out um, to, I just want to thank you all for being here. This conversation I've been looking forward to for a long time, and it it really did evolve into something powerful. And I hope people watching this tonight can, can really chew on this topic and you can take it into your life and that it'll help you. I know I'm walking away with a lot of great nuggets from each of you as to um, how in my personal life I can uh, lean in to the truth telling, right? So I just wanna thank you, Jen. I wanna thank you, G. And I wanna thank you, John, for spending some time with us tonight. You are all extraordinary. We're gonna drop some links in the chat so you can learn about these three extraordinary people and what they do. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So with that, was that was that not a word? I mean, we got all these, I'm, I'm catching mics left and right, trying to make sure they don't fall from all three of you. Um, but I hope that you guys gathered something really meaningful from this. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some programs that we have coming up. Um, let's see, we, as you know, Urban Consulate Cincinnati, is part of a nationwide network of urban consulates. Um, So our colleagues in Detroit and Chicagoland also host monthly conversations. Um, And if you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you will find all of these updates, but I wanna share some of them with you as a preview and be sure to join our mailing list. You can stay updated on everything we're doing. First things first, our next Urban Consulate Cincinnati will take place Monday, November 9th at 7 p.m. I want you to note the date. This is going to be a very, very important marker for Urban Consulate Cincinnati because it takes place after the 2020 election. 
So this will be a place where we can all gather, connect together, because however, you know, whatever the outcome is, we're going to need to come together, right? Um, and connect. Next up, we have on October 21st, practicing racial equity with leaders in philanthropy. This is um, Orlando Bailey, who is our counterpart at Urban Consulate Detroit, will be leading a phenomenal conversation with four, with three incredible leaders um, on this topic. On November 9th, um, this is the Urban Consulate Cincinnati program I was telling you about after the election. On November 11th, um, our partners Courageous Conversations um, will be featuring Eric Liu of Citizen University and the Aspen Institute. Um, the topic is Becoming America. This is gonna be an extraordinary dialogue. You won't want to miss out on this. You can join us virtually. Um, on November 18th, we have another installment in Practicing Racial Equity from our partners in the Urban Consulate Detroit. Um, and this time we'll be talking with journalists from the Associated Press and the Huffington Post. Now this is going to be a remarkable conversation. And then on December 16th, another installment in the Practicing Racial Equity series is um, talking with change makers in Detroit. So as you can see, the programming is rich, the dialogues are far reaching and they're being held. The, we're, we're, Urban Council is holding the space of all these very important dialogues. So we hope that you'll join us. And with that, um, I wanna thank each of you once again for being here with us in our virtual space. I hope you are all safe and staying well, being kind and good to yourself. Have a great night.